All right, folks, this is the 23rd episode. Can you believe it? The 23rd episode of the Tour de Todd Cycling Podcast. And I have someone on today. Uh, man, it's a blessing to see this man again. He may not remember when he met me, but I met him at the Blaine Velodrome in uh, Minnesota. He was there on a training camp with the national team. And it is Jamie Carney, the myth, the legend, the man himself. Thank you for joining, Jamie. Oh, thank you. This is, this is cool. I'm happy to be part. Not bad. Not bad. Okay. I want to ask you this. This first thing is, I didn't know that you were born in Detroit. Yep. Yep. My whole family, my, 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 both my parents, my brother. Yeah. All of us were born in Detroit. Are you serious? Yeah. Wow. 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 Okay. So tell me this. When did you start? When did you get on the bike? And when did you know this was your thing? Uh, We've been doing this for forever. So I, my, I learned how to ride a two wheel bike when I was four. My brother learned how to do it when he was three. That's before the striders and all that stuff. So my dad raced bikes, but he wasn't like all that great and all. But so we went from these little bikes to being on tandems. I was on the back of the tandem with my mom and my brother was on the back with my dad. Mm -hmm. And then um, as soon as I was racing age eight, I was, I was racing in 1976. And so that was- old. I was actually seven because my birthday is November 29th. So I was seven years old the whole entire time. So I was, oh. yeah, I was racing bikes. And um, my first race was a, was a time trial and there was virtually nobody there. Um, and I, I, and I won the time trial <laughs> for my age group. Right. So big deal, <laughs> but, but, but it was cool. Cause um, yeah, we, we've been racing bikes uh, forever. So it's interesting that both uh, Jonas and myself have been yep. doing this from the get-go. And that's, um, you know, that just leads me to a point that I've been hammering home to USA Cycling forever is lifelong customers. Mm -hmm. That's what they need to be working on. Um, all this other stuff that they're doing, um, those are transient uh, customers. They don't hold on to these people, right? You get a cat yeah. five, jumps in there when he's 35 years old, does it a couple of times, yep. things change, boom, it's not ingrained. And so, you know, someone barked back on Facebook, oh, we got to do this, that, and the other thing. I'm like, wait a minute. In the 90s, I don't remember racing against one person that didn't race as a junior, as a junior, right? Yep. So, like, they all race as a junior. Now they're seniors. Yep. Now that's not the case, right? No. That's the system. That's the broken system right there, is that the mm -hmm. fact that we don't have lifelong customers anymore. And people talk about Nike and Nike and Nike. I'm a collegiate varsity coach. Nike has a horrible um, retention rates to collegiate and beyond. It really does. They, Nike is great. They do lots of wonderful things. They have a lot of ninth graders. Yeah. And they have less 10th graders, less 11th graders, not many seniors, and then they don't race bikes anymore. Why is so that? that there's the, you know, USA Cycling will say they have a new relationship with Nike and blah, 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 but we hear a lot of noise. I, I'm not seeing any, um, any change. You know, it mm -hmm. really is. We, when you think about the business model for Nike, do they really care? I mean, this, this sounds really bad. This gonna, I'm, I'm going to get in a lot of trouble with this with you. I, 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 yeah. I, I, <laughs> this entire podcast is going to get me totally <laughs> reamed out by so many people um, because I'm blunt. Like that's, that's who I've been my whole entire career. Like just flat out, I'm just going to tell you the way it is. Mm -hmm. I'm Please. telling you there are a lot of great people in Nike, but once that senior goes away, that senior is no longer a customer to Nike, right? That's what it comes down to. So do they care that the kid that now can drive that's kind of getting a little bit, um, maybe a little bit of an attitude, whatever, whatever goes away? Mm -hmm. No, they're mm -hmm. worried about getting that next seventh grade, eighth grade, ninth grader, because those are their numbers, right? Then they yeah. had them for a long time. Yep. And so it's the same retention problem we have uh, with juniors on track, right? You look at, you go to nationals, typically it's like 10, 15 years ago. You look and go, wow, we have a lot of 13, 14 year olds. We have, a, we have a pretty good number of 15, 16 year olds. And all of a sudden 17, 18 dives off. It's cars, yeah. girls and boys, them doing different stuff. Yep. So that's the, you can identify the problem. So th there's solutions to these problems, but USA Cycling and what's Nike's investment to keep uh, keep a kid invested in cycling beyond their Nike career, it's it, it, it yeah. there's not much there. Yeah. So that's where we're really really um, disconnected. And I really wish that um, hopefully the new CEO, who is who was a racer, you know, you know Robbie yeah. D was not a racer, and I think that caused a huge amount of 
problems. And uh, he wanted to get $10 from every enthusiast on the planet to give money to USA Cycling, which was never going to happen. Yeah. So hopefully we get back to the juniors, go, get back to all the disciplines. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's the, uh, the, the true issue. It's like, we need to get all these kids. We got to uh, tap into all disciplines. We, there's got to be some crossover too. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, you've done a lot of crossover. I'm, I'm adding more stuff to my repertoire at 53. I got like a, a downhill bike now. Like, no really? kidding. I got, I got kids that are super interested in dual slalom downhill. We're build, building a dual slalom on campus right now because the kids liked it so much. I asked the president wow. for some land, land and he gave it to me. So we're building a dual slalom. And so here I am in my 50s starting something brand spanking new. You know, getting yeah. my wheels off the ground is, 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 is the new thing. Okay. So you, you went to Piedmont, was it 2016? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They didn't have a program. So you're starting out from scratch. How, oh, was, yeah. no, I, how was that? <laughs> um, I always tell when other schools approach me about starting a, a collegiate varsity team, I'm like, do you have a club? And they're like, oh no. I'm like, well, don't do what I did because none of us knew how difficult this is going to be. So yeah. I roll into here. I love it. I have a great meeting with the, uh, with the president and the VPs. And I come here, I'm like, boom, all right, I got to find the cyclists on campus. Zero cyclists. We didn't have one person that raced bikes or even road bikes. It was like bikes were illegal at Piedmont. Wow. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm starting a varsity program with zero athletes. So that was, that was a little rough. We got it off the ground and we got, uh, we have 16 people right now. It's about, it's been about 16 for a couple of years, but we have a really big incoming um, freshman class this next year. We have, I think we have like nine confirms already. I think we'll probably have maybe 12 to 15 people come in. So we're going to double in size. The okay, word so is that the, the, the word, ahead. the word is out. We have a, we have a great program. Like the difference between our program and virtually all the others is we race as many non-sanctioned races as we do collegiate races, right? Like we, I take the kids to Southern Cross, all these chain buster, you know, gravel races and all this different stuff. We do enduros. We do stuff because I want the kids to have great experiences. So mm-hmm. we're a collegiate varsity team that does all yeah. the collegiate varsity stuff. But on these other weekends, which is more, more weekends than not, yeah. it's like, what do, you, what do you guys want to do? And so we're constantly out there doing cool stuff. And, and that, that stuff isn't cheap. And I'm, take, I'm giving the kids experiences, right? That's the, that's the most important part. So. Okay, let me ask you this. From, having, from a person that has had a great junior career, under 23 career, professional career, to now going from that and moving into uh, women's cycling, working, working through there, and then getting to Piedmont. Here's my question to you. How difficult is it for a person with a great career to pick talent? Is that tough? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's tough, but one of the things, the main reason why on the collegiate varsity coaches because collegiate cycling saved, saved me. Yep. Um, a lot of people don't realize that sure. Um, I was a pretty good junior. I went to junior worlds. I got food poisoning that didn't go too well, but I, when I became a senior and I went to Olympic trials in 88, Mm -hmm. I got my butt kicked so bad that the next year when I was supposed to go to nationals, my dad was like, Hey, we got to, we got to make arrangements to go to nationals. I'm like, did you see what happened last year? I am not going to nationals to have that happen again. I'm, I'm not that good nationally. I was a good junior. Seniors are completely different. Boom. So I went to Penn State. I graduated from high school early at Palmer High in Colorado Springs and then went to Penn State right away. And collegiate cycling allowed me to develop over those years, have it fun, have it be great, have it be what I wanted it to be. And Mm -hmm. then boom, 88, basically holding on for dear life, barely finishing to 1992, winning everything just mopping it up and just, you know, I mean, it was, I won the Madison team pursuit and points race. If they had the scratch race, would have won that. They they had the missing. I would have won that had the Omni. I would have won that. I mean, I went from, I'm barely in the race Mm -hmm. to I'm dominating the race. And that was four years in those four years. What was the big thing? I mean, my father was always super, but it was Penn state, which kept me involved, kept it fun. And then there you go. So I'm in this position and trust me, I have, I have kids that are really talented, but the head, 
You don't know what they, it, it, this, this is way more head than this talent. You have to have talent, but if you don't have, I embrace pain and I want that. And how do I get there? Yeah. You know, some of these kids just want to do it for fun, which is totally, totally cool. My joke here at Piedmont is, you know, um, I treat everyone the same, but my favorite kid is often not the good kid because that kid isn't ha- unhappy about what happens. He, he puts in five hours a week and he knows that he's not going to win. He goes up there and races his bike and he's, and he's happy. Yeah. It's really bad when you get that kid that does six or seven hours a week and is always disappointed in the results because it's like, dude, you didn't, you didn't, why do you expect that you're going to do well? Like you're racing in this category with these people, you have to do what they do to be competitive with them. And so, yes. so the, the thing is, it's like, I'm trying to create the opportunity. So when that person with talent with the right head and drive wants to do it, mm-hmm. I got, it. I'm here for you. And so that brings me to the, the other point with this is what else, what else has hurt cycling over the years? Everyone likes to point to Lance Armstrong and all this other crap that's gone yep. on. It's really, when we're juniors in the eighties, we're seniors in the nineties, we get to the OOs, we retire. My brother retired. Everyone retires. Think about who many, how many people retired in the OOs. Well, guess what? They're in their thirties. They don't want to race anymore. Mm-hmm. Well, well, when Eddie B left, and this is going to get me in a lot of trouble again, too. It's no big deal. I, I can, I can handle the trouble on this because a lot of people love Eddie B or they hate Eddie B. I think he did a great job. I do too. Juniors, juniors, juniors back then. Yep. And guess what? That's why the health, the sport was so healthy in the nineties and the mm-hmm. OOs, mm-hmm. but they all aged out. When they kicked him out of there in 1989, we started ignoring juniors. When we ignored the juniors, all of a sudden, when my brother retires, there's not another junior to replace him because we don't have those numbers anymore. Yeah, There was no one to replace us after we aged out. And so that's what happened in the, in the 90s. We ignored the juniors. Then you get to the OOs. And what do we have? All right, I'm going to get in trouble. I'm going to say it so I can get, get out of the way. Jim Miller is a problem at USA Cycling. Jim you, Miller's program, yeah, it, it, he's, he's a problem. Why? Because all of a sudden when Jim Miller's in power, um, we're not sending juniors um, to junior worlds uh, on USA Cycling's time. It, the parents have to pay for it. Now the parents have to pay for talent ID camps, right? Now we have the ODA shit. That's Jim Miller, guys, okay? And guess what? He can come at me with a lawyer or whatever. It can be shown that that guy with his policies dismantled the domestic circuit, dismantled the machine that kept us rolling. Yeah. Not every kid's got enough money to um, pay for their ticket to Junior Worlds. When I went to Junior Worlds in 1986, we went with a full team. We had some great riders. We had Scott McKinley, we had Mike McCarthy, Aaron Fromm, really <laughs> awesome team. But guess what? We sent a full team. Anything that we had to start in, we sent people. That's what it was. That's good for the sport. When you take the incentives away, right? Take the incentives away, teams go away. So mm-hmm. why were there teams in the 90s? Because it was winner goes, right? Yeah. Even in the early, you know, 2001, 2002, 2003, we had World Cup qualifiers. Mm-hmm. Go to a World Cup qualifier, you win, you go. Jim got rid of that stuff. And he'll, he'll complain about, oh, well, it changed. You have to have UCI points to do to do this and the other thing, there's always an excuse to the, to, to the issue, but the incentive is yeah. not there. You, you don't have race. Like we don't have a national track series anymore. We don't have, no. we don't have a lot of these national series that we used to have. Yeah. When I was on the world's team in 1993 for the road, it's because I was winning the national point series on the road at the time period. That's how I made the world's road team. Right. Wow. I wasn't going to get selected by, by the coaches because I wasn't doing the Euro Disney thing. And I wasn't, you know, have, have, I just went over here and my results in Redlands and Gila and whatever, whatever, all the races that counted, I was the leading guy. Yeah. So after it was that after Road Nationals, whoever leading the points is automatic to the world's road team. Boom. There you go. That's what created incentive. So Shackley and all those different teams out there were like, hey, guess what? Here's the reason we're going to sell this to this sponsor saying, if we do this and we win these races, you're going to have an athlete at the Olympics. You're going to have an athlete doing this and the other thing. Coaches selection and all this other jazz and, and pay to play stuff has really, really hurt the sport. 
but it's easy to point at Lance, right? It's I, easy to point at Lance, easy, easy to point at all these other yeah. reasons why we're, we're sinking. Yeah. I can tell you right now, if we revert and go back to some of these policies we used to do, we'll, yeah. be, we'll be healthy five, five to 10 years. When it was announced that the juniors had to start paying for stuff, I couldn't believe what I was, what I was reading. Yep. I was yep. amazed. That, so what is, that's a, tr- that's not even a trade team. I mean, it's, it's, it's like pay to play. And I didn't quite understand. Exactly. You should you if you're good enough, you should be picked for the national team. If yep. you've done enough to qualify to race for the national team, that's what you should get. You shouldn't have yep. to pay whoever has the funds to be able to do it right. to get on the team. I, it's to me, I it was I was blown away. I couldn't fucking believe it. Yeah. Well, I was on the you know I was on the board of um, directors for USA Cycling from 2012 to 16. I was also the AAC rep which is yep. the athlete advisory council rep. Yep. And so during that time period, um, I was at all the board meetings. I was all at the AEC meetings. I was on the selection committee. I saw mm-hmm. what was going wrong. Mm-hmm. I saw what was going wrong firsthand. We had more arbitrations than any other NGB, national governing body. So swimming, gymnastics, traveling. Our sport of cycling had more arbitrations for selection than any other NGB. And... Again, there's a problem there. Wow. And so um, when you make it all coaches selection, when you make the selection committee appointed by a certain person who is making the uh, suggestions of who should be, you know, it, it was just a cluster, right? Yeah. I mean, it really, really was a cluster. And yeah. there's a reason why there was a big shakeup um, in 2017, 2018, unfortunately, yeah. Derek Bouchard Hall left to be the CEO of ASOS and Robbie D comes in and reverses some of the changes that Derek made yeah. that were for the better. So now we have Brendan and I think from his resume and from what I've seen and read, and he's gotten back to me before this all happened. Uh, yeah. We had a, we had an issue at collegiate uh, mountain bike nationals this year. Mm-hmm. No, I, 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 I full, I full blast admit, I, I do complain a lot. I don't hide that. If, when something's wrong and not hitting on all cylinders, I'm, I'm going to point it out. Well, somebody's got to say something. So, yeah, I mean, it's just basically, long story short, there's an uproar about normal mountain bike nationals and collegiate mountain bike nationals. So mm-hmm. think about this concept. Um, USA Cycling gives multi-year contracts to, to, to nationals. Mm-hmm. They do that because they complain that, oh, it, you know, these venues want to have multi-year and, and they don't do a great job the first time, but the second time so much better. There's, there's a whole uh, plate of explanation and reason. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. It doesn't work for the membership, right? That's, that's a money grab right there. That really is a money grab. All right, oh, we can get more money out of them if we give them these multi-year contracts. Well, mm-hmm. you, you piss off the membership. So this has happened um multiple times it happened at track nationals when they gave um excuse me um indianapolis was given the track nationals 93 94 95 the years before that there was always an east midwest west rotation always okay. i didn't we know knew. That. oh yeah no it was, it was beautiful it was this was in the, established in the 70s and went all the way through the 80s up until 93 so you think about it i can tell you every year what different nationals because we were in san diego right and then we were at T-Town, and then we were at Kenosha, and then we were in LA. Okay, it did, that's what it did. Okay. It was beautiful because a parent knew, hey, we can drive to nationals. Mm-hmm. Ooh, we have to save money because we have to fly to nationals. Mm-hmm. So all of a sudden, USA Second decides, nope, multi-year contract. Guess what happened? Indianapolis, let's say there was 100 units of riders there. Then it was 80, then it was 60. People didn't come back. Same thing happened in Park City. It's an interesting story. I mean, I've been a pain in the ass for everybody for, for a long time, but it's okay. So they gave Park City, uh, Utah, Road Nationals for three years. Yep. The first year, everyone goes there. And it's, you know, really, really high. I mean, Park City's way up there. They're, the road courses were really extremely hard. The crit, the crit was like freaking up and down. It was crazy. But anyways, the, at the second year, because everyone was upset, they were still there. I went mm-hmm. around and got a petition and a survey with all the parents all of the riders, and then presented it to USA Cycling. They realized that nobody was coming back to Park City 
for year three and they moved it. Wow. They were smart enough back then. That was, that was, you know, 15 years ago, but they were smart enough. So what happened? So we had the pandemic and everyone wants to blame the pandemic, right? You got to blame Lance for, for cycling to be in the, in the toilet and got to blame, blame the pandemic for every problem right now. Mm-hmm. Sorry, you can't really do that because when you give Durango, which is not really Durango, it's Purgatory. Purgatory is at 9,000 9, feet. Durango is at 6,000 feet. So we're having tra- uh, mountain bike nationals at 9,000 feet. That's pretty hard for a sea level kid. To compete, I was going to say, right? yeah, I was just going to say that. Jeez. So then, then you have Winter Park, where my brother has a house and he, he lives there part time. Um, is at nine thousand feet and had mountain bike nationals there for this is going to be the third year. Mm-hmm. Well, when you have a COVID year, so you it's not three year deal, it's now a four year deal because COVID hit a pause, so no up. one had an opportunity, right? So for collegiate, it went. Um, it was supposed to be a purgatory for two years. Oops, they have wildfires. They can't have it there. So, of course, they sent a big bear. No problem, whatever. All right, so now we have a COVID year. Okay, understandable. Okay, now we're, this year we're going to be at purgatory. Okay, but now they're going to have a purgatory again. Now, so you think about this. An East Coast kid, okay, hasn't had mountain bike nationals, has not had mountain bike nationals on the east side or near sea level since, um, since 2016. So all of my kids since 2016 have not had an opportunity to race on their half of the country at a lower elevation. Yeah. And so I pointed that, that out to everybody at USA Cycling and then to Brendan, you know, chair of the board, right? Yeah. Going, hey, like, here's a, here's a problem. And yeah. here's, a survey, here's, a, here's a survey that somebody else wrote, not me, about Winter Park. Because yeah. it's the same thing. They have a three-year contract there. So their three-year contract is also four years because they didn't have the wildfire. So they had it once there yeah. and then they had a COVID year and they had it there this year, but they're having it back. Parents are pissed. There was a, a petition that was signed by like 1500 people saying, Hey, this is not fair. You know? So think about this. If you're a junior kid, if you're a junior from sea level, now you haven't had for two age groups, two, two age groups, you have not had a fair shot to do well at nationals. Yeah. Doesn't make any sense. Right. Wow. So the multi-year contract thing is just, it just, it's just ridiculous. But anyways, my solution to them was give a multi-year contract, but saying, Hey, guess what? It, there's a rotation. You're one of the three people. So every yeah. third year you're, you're going to, you're going to have your thing. There. So why not? That's, yeah. that's the way to do it. That's the solution. But I think the, the initial money grab is the problem, right? We have to get, we have to get long-term customers to USA cycling and cycling in general. And we have to think about, retention and doing the right thing by the kids right mm-hmm. okay you know here's a kid that doesn't do well at, at altitude so why we're we going to do this to him for four years right here's the yeah. kid that is from altitude you know hey we can't have it at sea level every single time right so it's just making it a it's thinking about your member right think so about the even, person. even it out right yeah just take care of the people that are involved in the sport that person that 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 ski resort is not you know a usa second customer they're, mm-hmm. they're getting something in return, right? They're, yeah. Trust me, when Purgatory made, the minimum they made on the lift tickets for the downhill riders um, was $7,000. That was like, if it was only athletes in like 20 coaches, they made $7,000 on lift tickets, right? Because wow. we have to have a downhill that needs a lift ticket, right? Yeah. You yeah. need to. Yeah. They, they can't, they, they can't find a, a place <laughs> where we can, we can, we can do shuttles and it could be for free. Right. You know, you got to buy a $70 or whatever. I can't remember how much it was, but it was, the math was minimum 7,000, maybe 9,000 bucks. So that's the reason why we have to be at a ski resort. So, now I tell you, it's, I, it's, tell, I knew the system was wrong when I, I did an interview with Daniel Holloway recently, and he talked about how USA cycling had sent him to get the num to get the points and everything. Yeah. And he didn't get picked for the Olympics. Yeah. And yeah. I, 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 I listened, I listened to that interview. That was, it was really, I, I should have re-listened to it before our conversation because Danny and I have a, a good relationship. We agree on a lot of different stuff, but we disagree on some things. Yes, Absolutely. Sir. Which is really, it's, it's, it's totally cool. I mean, that's the way you, you want to have it. You don't want to have friends that you're just, he always agreeing with right yes yeah, but it's like but he had, he had some very very good things to say that were very accurate um and 
I would say that, you know, um, if he went back and looked at some of our conversations prior to him not being selected, yeah, he might take my words and my criticism to the system yeah. a little differently. Because guess what? It kind of unfolded the way I said it was going to unfold, right? Wow. Like you can't, like you can't, and, I, and Danny, don't get pissed at me, but like I call everybody out all the time 24 7 365 i'm not this person's buddy and defending 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 and then when it doesn't go my way then chastising right it's like i'm i get in trouble all the time and i'm not saying that he did that i'm just saying that whether the system's working for me or not yeah. i look at the system and I go whoa this is this is wrong this isn't right like the selection committee the way it was for 2016 prior there was a reason why there were so many arbitrations right yeah. You yeah. needed, I even suggested, think about this, suggested when I was on the selection committee that we record. Why are our selection committee calls not recorded? And people are like, oh, I won't mention names of who were like, no, we can't do that. It's like, what are we saying about the, dur during these conversations that you don't want to be public? Yeah. About Everything that I'm saying. Yeah. It's like, you know, I want to be on record when I'm defending why I think Carmen Small should be selected to the Olympic road team in 2016. I want it to be known. Yeah. I don't want it to be hidden. Yeah. Right. And I want to also be on record for the arbitration. Whoa, 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 whoa. You said this, mister, and you said this, miss. It's like when it's not recorded, there's a little flip flopping going on. It gets muddy. It gets yeah. muddy. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, so let, me, let me ask yeah. you this, though. I'm curious of your thoughts on Aaron Hartwell being now the national sprint coach. It's, it seemed for a while that the national track team was in disarray. It was, you know, they had the, the, the team pursuit. It was going quite yep. well. The women's, let me put it this way. The women's was doing great. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. The men's just didn't see, it seemed like it was in the ether somewhere. Yeah. I mean, realistically, um, uh, speaking of which, you know, what, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, Keep the subject the same, but I'm, I'm going to change it just a hair. Talk so, to me. Th so this can be put out there so everyone understands what happened in 2016 with the women. So in 2016 with the women, there was a lot of uproar about Ruth Winder not being ridden in one of the rides. And she didn't yep. get a medal because of that. Yep. You know, Ruth is a really good person. It would have been great to be able to ride her. I, you know, and it wasn't my call, but if it was my call, I wouldn't have ridden her either because you couldn't have done it. Okay. Because in qualifying, you have to ride your best time possible, right? Yep. Qualifying for team pursuit is like, it is critical. Okay. If you're not, you know, in the top four, you're not racing for a gold, right? You, you, you have to qualify in the top four. The way that it works is yep. like top four race each other one versus four, two versus three. You need to get in the top four. If you're not in the top four, the best you can do is race for bronze, yep. right? So you got to ride your best. And I can tell you, and there's not one person on that team or any of the coaches will tell you that, that Ruth wasn't the fifth rider. She was the fifth and it wasn't close. It wasn't like, oh, it's only like one second different. It's like Ruth was our fifth rider, no question, but she was not as, as, as strong as Kelly. And you're not going to switch. You're, Kelly Caitlin. Did, no, no, no. So, Did she know going in that she was the fifth? Oh yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Two times, two, two, two time periods. Um, Andy Sparks, the national team coach of the time period, like on, a, um, I could get the days wrong, but I mean, it really was two days in advance, two days in advance, like on a Tuesday is like, Hey, okay. On Thursday, you guys have off tomorrow on Thursday, we're doing these efforts, full race gear, full everything to yep. see where everybody's at. And yep. both times that they did that Ruth, was popped much earlier than, than Kelly was. That's, that's just the honest truth. Mm -hmm. So, all right, so you, you roll into qualifying, you have to ride your best team, right? Yep. Yep. So here's the thing, I'm, I'm really good friends with Gary Sutton, our new coach. I've been, I've been friends with him for a very, very, very long time because he's an Australian. I went to Australia yep. for 11 years to, you know, to win handicaps and do my things, right? Will races. I'm, I'm really good friends with him, so. We're on the bus before qualifying even happens. And his team had crashed in, in training the day before. And I'm on the, on the bus with them. Hey, Gary, how's, how, how's your riders going? 
and he's honest with me flat on us. Oh man, you know, like that was a bad crash and you know, so-and-so and so-and-so is hurt. If we can just get through qualifying, I know, I know we'll be flying for round one. Okay. So here you go. You got a team that just crashed. You got a couple of riders banged up. We got qualifying in like a day off. And then they have the first round, right? Which is the quarterfinals. We do qualifying. We're second. They're third. We have to ride them. They're the current world record holders. Okay. Before this, before this ride, before the, the, the round of one, the, the quarterfinal ride, yep. they are the current world record holders. They had just crashed two days before that. Can we ride our fifth rider? Can we? We're number two. They're number three. They're the current world record holders. You can't, you can't ride your fifth rider. No. Okay? No. You can't. You okay, got to come out so smoking. You, you got you, you to gotta go, holy crap. We don't know how much faster they're going to go, but they're going to go a lot faster. Yeah. So boom. We go out there, we do beat them handily, but knowing the information, knowing the conversation I had with Gary, knowing yeah. that the current world record holders, there's no way you can't write a best team. Now we broke the world record in that ride. And now, yes, we had the world record for five minutes because the great, the British beat, beat ours right at the, but it was close. It was not by much. It was by tenths of a second, not like two seconds. So here we are again, we're in the gold medal ride. We just broke the world record. Yeah. We're going to switch our, 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 our setup a little bit. You know, they're going to change the gears a little bit. Chloe's yeah. going to do this, that, and the other thing. Yeah. Kelly's going to do this, swing out in the middle of the ride. We're going to go for the win. We're not going to put the fifth rider in. So why yeah. are we going to do that? Smart. Right? So I understand that the, the feelings from all sides. But I'm just putting out there, boom, on your podcast. Yes, sir. Information, information that no one has, okay? Because that's the reason why she wasn't written. It wasn't because somebody didn't like somebody or this or the other thing. Every single one of our rides required us to go full gas, yeah. right? Yeah. If we qualified first and we weren't going against Australia, sure, she could have ridden in that ride, no question. Yeah. You know, if, if we didn't get into the final we arrived for third and fourth way and we knew that the other team wasn't within three or four seconds of us yeah i mean i know for a fact that she would have been ridden under different circumstances but that was my clarification on what happened said audience in in rio right just let everybody know that's that's the the real it sounds like there. it sounds like a tactical decision and you yes, just have to is. make it and that's that but it, it, but it really, it, um, you know, it really got heated up and Andy took a lot of criticism um, that he, he didn't deserve. He, he really was, um, that was one of the main just, you know, things out there. And it was just like, there was no way for him to ride her. There's no way, you know. He's a hell of a coach. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. And that's the thing is, so I think his the criticism he got for that was uncalled for and it was blown out of proportion and, and um so at least it's out there. See, you got this. You know, so thank it's, you. It's, a, it's on the podcast. Thank you. Thank you. Let me ask you that. Oh, you know, I want to tell you this. You, you brought up Gary Sutton. Last night, I BS you not, I was sitting there watching him win the, the Bernie. Uh, I yeah. watched it on YouTube. Man. There you go. Okay. I got oh, to yeah. ask you. I got to ask you about Australia because th it was the one thing that I regret not ingratiating myself with you because I had heard that you were going over there when we were younger. And yep. I, w I really wanted, it was one of my goals as a young man was to race the carnivals in, in, uh, in Australia in December. So please tell me about that, that experience. And how did you, well, first of all, how in the world did you first hear about it and get over there? Well, this, um, this is actually a really, really good question because it's, it's one of my biggest mistakes I've ever made. So back in the late eighties, um, I'm riding really, Pat McDonough, who used to, you know, run T-Town, used to yep. say stuff to people behind my back. He, he used to say, well, if you come into T-Town and you race against me, you know, I could beat the world champion. At that track, I'm, 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 I, I'm a lot better than I am anywhere else. And that was the truth, yeah. truth back then. The truth back then is I would go to nationals 
um, and really wouldn't do too much. But if you raced me in T-Town, I could elevate my game just because that's my track. Yeah. I just was, was so comfortable there. Yeah. So here we have Australians coming in, racing at T-Town. And one of these, um, these guys, his name was Craig Milton. I even remember his name. He's just like, hey, you have to go to Tasmania in the wintertime. We have these handicaps and do all this different stuff. And I'm like, I'm looking, I'm like, what, whatever. And he's, he's, he's explaining it to me and I'm still just not like getting it. So no, no, they don't know who you are. And you're really good. You're going to go over there and you're going to make thousands of dollars. I'm just like, eh. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy going to Penn State racing at Tito. So fast forward, no kidding. It's 10 years later, 10 years oh later. God. And another, another Australian, um, you know, Shane Hotskis, yeah. same deal. So Stephen Payton and Shane Hotskis are, are racing at T-Town. And Shane, his, um, they're racing, we were, were racing at like the Vandadrome. So it was like 1998. And so the Vandadrome was at, um, in Chicago, the taste of Chicago. And, you know, um, that's another track where it, it doesn't matter who you put on the Vandadrome against me. Yeah. I mean, you know, John Vandeville will tell you, like I was unbeatable on that track, just doing stuff. Um, and it's just because I'm not, I'm not that big of a guy. And um, it's always, it's, it's really, it's funny, the scarier, dumber the track is like Alpen Rose. I can show up <laughs> at Alpen Rose after not riding my track bike for a, a year and, and, and ride really great there. But anyways, Shane Hotsis goes, hey, you have to come to Tasmania. We, you know, we will pay for everything for you to get over there and, and blah, 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 blah. You know, so they pay for my plane ticket. They, they had the, the car, his father was the carnival's coordinator. So the son oh. of the guy who organizes everything, I'm staying at their house. And um, it was really, it was really, really cool. So I, I pop over there and um, they're like, it's a handicap person, so you get a mark, right? Yeah, so yeah. they're like, um, you're, you're gonna be from scratch, zero. And people, pe so people, people were against that. Some people like the traditionals, like these older men, like they, they raced, oh, that, that, he's, how do we know that he's that good? And Stephen Pate at the time, wow. <laughs> Stephen Pate goes, goes to them, he's like, no, he belongs on scratch with me. And, and Shane was like, uh, yeah, him and Patey and him, like they split wins between each other when they race each other. It's like, you know, so, and people were like, back then, Katie was winning everything else. Yes. Right. Yep. So, yep. so supposedly this, this kid from freaking America is beating Stephen Pate once in a while. That, that this is unheard of. Yeah. So I went there and um, it was funny. My first year there, scratch, a, a scratchman, we got, we won nothing. We won, we, did, we didn't win from scratch. That year, the Hinky wow. handicapper had, had screwed it up so bad that we never won a race of like the 18 handicap finals we did but Damn. it's just like it's like baseball over there they statistically they they um they what you call it, they look at everything and so yeah. after after everything was said and done i had won uh, more scratch races than anybody that year so yeah. so that was just a graders racing a graders and you know shane kelly's out there other people are out there so i'm, I'm racing against really superstar guys and i'm yeah pulling <laughs> stuff off but I made more handicap finals, finals than anybody from any mark. So I was in the finals a lot, but we never had the power to catch, catch to the front. How so many, they were worried. So how the many, thing is they, they were worried that I wasn't going to come back because here I am, this American coming in there, and sure I had some good, good fun in some of the, um, the scratch races, but the, you know we didn't make a lot of money. So, oh, please come back! I'm, I'm, I promise you, it'll be better next year. And they didn't realize it's like, oh no, this is the coolest thing in the world to race in front of thousands of people. I don't care how much money I'm making. I'm, I'm worried about like, this is, this is real track racing again, right? I'm now rediscovering what I had at T-Town in the late eighties. Now I'm, it's back and it's, and it's super and it's a lot of fun. And I mean, I couldn't believe how great some of these people I've never heard of before. Like I didn't know, never heard of uh, Darren Young before. So my Are you first serious? Wow. Well, no, you're talking about, you're thinking about Darren, you're thinking about Darren Hill. Oh, yes, yes, Darren, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. D Darren Young, different guy. He looks like Robbie Williams, the, the, the Australian singer guy, but he, it's really funny. But, but he's, um, I'm in the scratch race off the front in, in Lawn Cessna's indoor 285 uh, wood track. It's really awesome. I mean, I'm going to light it up. I'm going to win. And I got rolled by someone. I had, it's like, what the hell? I just got, I just got beat. And it's like, you find out that, there's so many great Australian track riders that yes. you never hear about because it's just their 10th best guy is awesome. 
right? And so if, if the national team's the top eight, that nine and 10, 11, 12, those guys are still really, really good. I mean, that's a re- they win junior worlds at every, like almost every event with everything, right? So that's, they're, they have so much depth that it's, um, it was a lot of fun. It was, it was great. I, I went back there 11 years in a row. I went back there until I wasn't competitive anymore, basically. You know, I got to my upper 30s and was like, okay, uh, I'm, I'm not off scratch anymore. And I, and I, I can't, yeah. you know, I can't do it. So I maximized yeah, but, it. But some of the guys that you were racing against, they were amazing. I, I, I remember you racing against Graham, uh, Graham Brown. Yep. Um, yep. Uh, Brett Lancaster. Yep. I, I, okay, those guys went over to Europe. Graham Brown was an amazing sprinter. Brett Lancaster, yep. great short time trialist, great lead out man. Do I, I, I've got to, I've got to, I, I got to go. <laughs> so I'm not going to get in trouble for this, but I mean, it just kind of puts things into, into perspective just to relax. So one year, I try to think what year this was, maybe it was 2002. Um, I'm, I'm, yeah, because in 2001, I won Mr. Carnival, which was the best, best rider at the carnivals. Um, that means you won more races than everybody. Yeah. So this next year, I was like, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be even better. I'm going to come back and I'm going to kick her his butt. So no kidding. I stopped drinking alcohol for three months. I stopped. I mean, I really, really dialed everything in. I was going to come to Tasmania and I was going to kill everybody. Like they thought I was good last year. I'm going to kill them this year. No kidding. We do the first race. Graham, Graham Brown just kills all of us. You know, just kills us. And I'm just like, all right. We go to... Um, uh, Launceston, same deal. Indoor track. I'm like, all right, I have, I have an advantage now. I'm, I'm, I'm more of an indoor guy. Yeah. Boom. Kills us again. I'm just like, wow. And people are frustrated. Like, you know, because Graham Brown is a, is a good friend of mine, but you always have the, um, the villains and, and, the, and the good guys and the bad guys. And yes. he's, always, he's always been a little bit of a bad guy. Out he's there, always right? been the villain. Yeah, he's, he's got a temper. Yeah. So, um, I'm frustrated. I'm like, I wanted to ride good. I'm not riding good. I can't, I can't do anything. So I, I went out um, drinking that night in Lawn Sesting because that's where I was staying. Um, probably had, you know, you know, more than I should have. But I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll, but, so we get, we get into the, uh, we get into the um, um, Devonport scratch race final. And Graham's got, got his lead out going, you know, because that was his, his deal. He needed his lead out would just go a bazillion miles an hour and you couldn't come around him. Well, I, I'm, I'm coming around him and I'm getting him and he hooks the crap out of me, like full gas, like just like, it's no problem because I'm, I'm used to that. You got to remember, I, I raced at T-Town. Yeah. I had to deal with, with Marty and all that crap for the longest time. So yeah. hooks don't usually slow me down. In fact, you're probably going to get that little bit more out of me now, right? So. Yeah. I still get around them. I still roll them. I, I beat them. And then the, uh, the commissars um, and the crowd goes wild because everyone has been waiting for someone to beat the, the, the yeah. bad guy, right? Yeah, yeah. The officials are going to relegate them. And I'm like, hey, I mean, I was fine. I didn't say, like, oh, but that could have caused a crash. Like, we were clear. Like there was third place was not close to us, right? We yeah. were going a million miles an hour. So I had to, to talk them into just letting the, the standings. I wanted his name after my name, right? That's what I wanted. I didn't yeah. want to, so, but yeah, it was um, the power of just, you know, relaxing and, and, and not getting stressed out. That was that, was that, uh, that race. I um, probably could have had a few less drinks that night, but you know what, um, you know, it, it, it relaxed me. I went out there, I gave him everything. And then, then we started training races after that. That was really yeah. cool. Yeah. Cause we still had like three races left to do. And, and, um, it was cool. It was fun. Yeah. I mean, it, it was you know, Titanic battles out there. Gary Newand, um, yep. Ryan Bailey, all those guys would, um, would come. Yeah. Darren Hill was there a, a few years, but yeah, it was, it was, um, it was some of the best racing I ever did in my entire life. And again, nobody really knows too much about it. You know, that's, that's, the, the, that's thing. the issue. That's the thing. When I, when I first heard about him, I was 16 years old, 16, 17. I was like, what the hell? The carnivals. So I started looking at him, looking him up and I'm like, this is absolutely amazing. So yeah. 
I'm thinking, how in the world can I get over there? Who do I know? I don't know anybody. I'm, and I'm just this dude in Minneapolis who's got a track and I'm, I'm burning up the track and no one knows who I am. So it was, yeah. I, I always wanted to race the carnivals. You tell me this, how many races within the month is there? And if people don't understand, there's a lot more stuff that's going on. It's like athletics, wood chopping contests yeah. and stuff like that. This is like big, on time, big time stuff going on. Oh yeah. So basically when you, um, you show up to a carnival, you know, there's typically running and wood chopping in, in Tasmania. So in between the R races, there's other stuff going on, but you know, we're there. Um, and again, I, I try my hardest not to exaggerate about stuff. You know, on average, the carnivals will say, will say start like at 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning, but you're there until 10 PM. Right. And, and you're, you're, there's a little bit of intermission in the middle, but not yeah. a massive one. Yeah. So, um, I brought Andy Sparks and uh, Sarah Hammer and a few other people over the years with me over there. Mm -hmm. and I was like, yeah, you, you know, I might race 12 times today. And they're like, what? I'm like, yeah, 12 times. Because if I do, do think about this, every single day had a lightning handicap, which was a thousand meters. And then they had an electric one, which is 2000 and a 3000. So if you do just those handicaps and you make the finals and I yeah. almost always make the finals, that's yeah. six rides. Then you have scratch races and elimination. They have a thing called a derby, which is like a short scratch race. Which is crazy. It's like, <laughs> what are we going to do? We're having a 24 person scratch race for two laps. Like, okay. Wow. Yeah. There, yeah there's sometimes they do heats to, to finals for a derby. Um, but sometimes they were like the first one I won was at um, Latrobe. And Roberto Gaggioli was there. It was really funny. Roberto, my first year there, shows up to this. Wow. Uh, thing races the track and it was it was funny You're like what are we doing we're doing like a two-lap scratch race on this 365 meter track what flat track and like flat track how is yeah. that gonna work i'm making fun of this shit and then i win the race right <laughs> it's like i'm making like this is really stupid and i win it i'm like oh i won the stupid race that's awesome so wow. um but yeah we, we average racing between minimum eight times sometimes 12 13 times in one day problem is you wake up the next day and you do it again. You wake up the next day, you do it again. Because at the carnivals, the big ones are, you do La Trobe and sometimes La Trobe has been two days and sometimes it's one day. But when, you know, I think when, when it was two days when that was more times than not, then you had Launceston and you had two days at Devonport and then mm -hmm. usually one day off and then Bernie. Yeah, Bernie. So six days of racing in seven days, right? Racing 12 times. And these, this is not, this is not the one, the number one thing in America that drives any of us who've raced in Australia crazy is the neutral lap. Do you know how fast a neutral lap is in Australia? It's a racing lap. It's not like <laughs> when we're, when we're at East point down here, at Atlanta, we roll so slow. I'm wondering if we're going to slide off the track. I don't under, even understand it. And so like in the late races, I'm bringing the riders to the bottom of the track and we start winding it up a little bit. Yeah. They're like, Hey, this is neutral. It's like, Dude, get your heart rate over a hundred on the neutral lap. It's fine. Let's yeah. let's get this rolling. So, so these races handicaps are all out, right? You have to catch the people in front of you to qualify. Yeah. So you're doing a standing kilo as hard as you can. You get in the final. You're doing a standing kilo as hard as you can. Two K, same things. Two K. So the racing is extremely hard. And when you do it one day, you're like, oh, can I do that again? It, may, it changes your mentality of what you can do and what you cannot do. Yeah. You, do a, you do a track workout here in America and it's, oh, that was really, really hard. It's like, um, come to Tasmania, race one day there and understand you're doing the same thing the next day. So it shows you how tough you can actually, actually be. Yeah. But that, and that, that, that's kind of racing got me so um, strong. Uh, it, was really, um, it was really fun. One year, came back from that, there's a stage race still going on. Um, people call it VOS. It's the Valley of the Sun stage race. Yep. In, yep. Um, Arizona. Yep. And so it used to be a big deal. It was on the national calendar yep. once or twice, but yep. still, even when it's not, you have a lot of good people showing up there. So yep. I come back from Australia, you know, it's a month later and the VOS is going on. The whole navigators team is there and the postal service is there too. Um, Vandeveld and dylan casey and like two of their teammates Amazing. were there so show up and i get second in the time trial behind vandeville and then i get second in the road race one guy off the front but i beat vandeville in the sprint and then i won the criterium and won the over, overall by myself 
no teammates. And it was like, that's my Tasmanian fitness. If, I mean, it's February and I've just been racing world and Olympic champions. So. Yes. Yes. But everyone's like, what's going on? It's like, don't worry, guys. I'm, I'm peaked out right now. <laughs> <laughs> this is all I can do. And it's February. So I'm taking Dude. advantage of my, my, my fitness. So no, let me ask you yeah. this. Do you, do you, did you ever consider a career in Europe? Six days, anything like that? Well, I did this six days one year in 2001. Um, it, was, it, it was interesting. I, I, I knew, you know, obviously drugs were a real bad problem in our sport in the 90s and the early O's, but I knew my dad always wanted me to go there and try the six days, right? Yeah. So went there and um, I did a few um, and uh, it was everything I thought it would be, you know, a lot of, a lot of stuff going on. Uh, the difference was in 2001, the swan years weren't supposed to uh, do things for you anymore. All of the doping stuff was on your own accord. So you, yeah. you rolled up in there and Patrick Sirku and, and the people running the stuff was like, hey, you know, and, and, and using wording so you couldn't use it against them. But basically, long story short, read between the lines. Hey, the Swan years used to dope all, all the six day riders and you, they would take care of it and you'd have to pay them for it or whatever. Hey, you know, there's a bunch of shit going on. You know, there's raids happening. You know, the sport's supposed to clean up. So everybody's on their own. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm in one of the six days and the guy, everyone's in a different cabin. And I look and I, see an IV bag come out of this guy's arm because everyone's trying to do whatever they need to do to, to recover or to race well. And I'm looking at going, that says Activagen. I said, hey, isn't that, isn't that illegal? And the guy goes to me, I, I can't remember what country he's from, but he, he speaks pretty decent English, but he wasn't an English writer. He goes, oh yeah, but you know, I could take this and in, in, in pee in the cup right now and, and they wouldn't be able to catch me. And so this was the stuff, this was the stuff just so that people have context here. Because again, I have to remember this is all this stuff I'm telling you is 20 years old, right? So yeah. a lot of the kids that might listen to this won't even know what I'm talking about when I'm talking yeah. about this. Yeah. So back in the day um, when they were trying to bust the postal service for all this stuff, somebody went to a trash can and found bags of this stuff called Activagen. And they tried to pin that on the postal service. But long story short, that's a, like a, it's an isolate to like calf's blood or something like that. They use it for burn patients basically, but it, it promotes healing. So this guy though has got, so just letting you, you know, again, I, I'm a clean rider. I've always been a clean rider. That's yes, the way I roll. And um, I did this for my father, got my ass kicked at Dortmund and got uh, crashed in Munich. Had to go to the emergency room, get a splinter taken out of my leg. Woo. And then I went to, went to Zurich and um, at Zurich, um, we ended up beating four teams out of the 18 or whatever like that. And I was like, cool. I went to one and we didn't get last place. I quit. And that was it. That's pretty much what happened. And I did some other six days in um, some Mexican ones, which were really, yeah. Um, yeah. oh, that's what I was going to say with, with, with regard to, to, to Danny. I, I, I love me some Danny Holloway. I think he's mm -hmm. great. And yeah, we're talking about 10 years different from when he was there, when I was there. Yeah. And there is some, there, there is some truth to the top teams racing it out but you know during my time period they would go to you and go hey you guys take two laps you guys take three laps i mean it was way more fixed 10 years before when danny was doing it it was way more fixed than the light that he has shed it on so maybe i'm not yeah. saying what it's it's different than what he's saying i'm just saying prior to that yeah it was, it was very fixed like when wow. we had when we, when we did the ones when we did the ones outside of Europe, you knew what place you got, you were going to get before the race even started. Okay. You knew you like, oh, oh yeah. It was like, yeah, I think Colby and I did one. I'm like, Hey, yeah, you guys are going to get sixth place overall. Is that cool? And we're like, do we have a fucking say? Right. And so people like, you know, you know, Matthew Gilmore and I never really got along too well. Um, He's from Tasmania, yep. great six-day rider. Yep, um, I know him. But, but he, um, 
he never really showed me any respect, um, to be honest with you. So whenever I had an opportunity to light him up, because I was faster than him, you know, like flat out, like no question, <laughs> I beat him. I beat him any, any, any sprint we go for, I would beat him. He was strong, but, um, but yeah. But anyways, long story short, I would light it up and he, he wouldn't like it. And I'm like, hey, you know, you know, you, you're telling everybody that I'm a shit rider. Well, guess what? I just smoked you, buddy. You know, I love that was it. one of my, my, yeah. One of my favorite uh, wins. I won the, the Moscow World Cup scratch race. Um, yep. Like in 2005 or something like that. Maybe 2006. I can't remember. I'm but anyways, so I, I win this scratch race. What people don't realize is, you know, we're in this breakaway and, you know, um, everyone's doing crazy, crazy amount of work to try to catch us. And Matthew Gilmore gets to us. He, he, the, break, the break gets close enough and he, he jumps across and he doesn't pull through, right? You know, and it's, you know, it's coming into like four or five laps to go. He just mm -hmm. got there. I mean, it's like, it's no big deal. I'm just trying to stay off. Well, I, I let it out for 500 meters and I won. And he All couldn't right. come around. I, hold on. So, let me do. <laughs> 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 I mean, that's the thing. It's like, I've, 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 I've had been able to pull things out of, if he wasn't, if he, if he didn't bridge up, I don't know, but I got a lot stronger when he got there because it's like, Oh, you know, I, I love it. I have a, I have more motivation to win now. So, but anyways, I mean, again, it's like, it's all, it's all good to, um, to um, it's competition. Right. So that's, you know, it's, yeah. it's fun. But did you, did you ever do the one, this is the one that I don't think a lot of people know about. They're in the middle of the summer in Europe. There's a there's a six day in Europe in Italy. Yeah, yeah. I did never you... I never did I never did that one. I mean I um I've I've done um, a lot of World Cup. Um, matches. Yes, you have. Um, yes, you have. Yeah. And so um, that's always interesting how that goes, good or bad. Um, I think the um, I rode that one with Basil Milsol, and we did not last that long. Basil is a guy that was a flash in the pan, but he's really, really good kid. Yeah. Um, but he wasn't in the sport for that long. But yeah, it was one of these World Cups you roll into and like, hey, you can ride, you know, you ride with this little kid and, and see what happens. And it's like, well, this is going to be fun and didn't last very long. So. Okay, let me ask you this. This is something that I notice a lot. Um, you'll have six guys that are really, really good at, at six days. But then when it comes to a World Cup, they don't always do so very well. Yeah. I don't, can you explain that to me? Well, you know, once again, when you have um, back in my day, when the six day riders were doing things, right? And okay. the World Cups okay. is a little, bit, a little bit harder to not do those things. Okay. And when things are kind of fixed on one end and the other stuff is it's, it's wide, wide open. And the other thing, the gear is different too. Back then, like now when, you know, when Danny was doing six days, they, they moved the gears up. Back when I was doing it, we were still using really, really small gears. But you go to a World Cup and you'd almost go, you'd go to a different cog in the back, right? So if you're doing the six days in a 53-16, then you're doing a World Cup in a 53-15, right? Yeah. So apples and oranges there, you know? Okay. So yeah. it was, um, yeah, I mean, that was the, the interesting thing. It's, it's just unfortunate that, cycling changes too fast for it to um for people to have any real history like so the fact that i was world cup champion in in 2001 and 2002 and now world cups are are really different back then back in the 90s and the early 2000s your best guy showed up three out of your five world cups counted you know there was prestige behind stuff now um hey they had their the new uh, UCI track stuff about right you know um, yeah. Gavin just did really well um, that's awesome but it's only awesome if they do this for 10 years right yeah because yeah. like if they do it for two years and then switch it again hey switch again that's the problem right mm -hmm. you want to have some history um, that's the reason why those Tasmanian Christmas carnivals are so awesome they've been going around since 18 like 88 right yeah so yeah. the history behind that when you look at the names you can say guess what these are the winners over a century have won this bike race. So there's yep. history. Yeah. We're changing stuff too much. People keep on forgetting like the Madison was, was brought into the Olympics in 2000. Right. 
And guess what? Oh, it's back. But I mean, it's, it's come and gone and come and gone. Like yes, the points race was the, the first time the points race for the Olympics was in uh, 84, right? So there's been so much swapping around other than a couple classic events like the sprints. That it's kind of, it's kind of crazy. Yeah. Do you think that, do you like the new format for the Omnium? Um, yeah, I do. It's just, um, you know, um, I like it. I, I just don't like the fact that we've gutted so much of the other stuff out, you know, not out of the anime itself, just in, in general. Right. And now, so now that you have the Olympics and the world championships not matching, are the best people really racing some of these races at, at, at the worlds? The answer yeah. is no. Yeah. And so when I was at the world championships during my career, I knew in that scratch race, the best scratch race riders in the world were doing that event. Mm. Now, maybe a country doesn't ride their best points race rider, best scratch race rider, because that person's saving it for the Omnia, right? So yeah. now you kind of, on the sprint side, it's really great though. On the sprint, I mean, they, you know, you do team sprint, you do Karen, you do, you know, sprint, you're, yeah. you know. Yeah. On the endurance side, it's, it's, it's a little frustrating for me to see that some of the best, why isn't so-and-so not doing the points race? Well, yeah. because he's doing team pursuit the next day and he's doing the Omnium after that. So yeah. they need to think about that a little bit more, um, yeah. I think. But yeah. um, having, you know, it's frustrating for me to see how many events they add to the Winter Olympics every single year. And we've had to cut cycling events, right? Yeah. So now that's changing. Now they're realizing, hey, more is better. So we're probably going to get a few more events back, which is great. But yeah. we, we cut some money out yeah. because back then, back in 2000, if you added an event, you had to get rid of an event. Now yeah. they're realizing, ooh, that's not helping, you know, anybody. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. I know you're busy. So I'm going to, we're going to, I'm going to do some quick shots at you if you don't mind. Okay. That's cool. are. All right. So if you, Jamie Carney had a limited budget, uh, unlimited budget. Let me put it that way. Unlimited budget. What bike would you ride? And would it be mechanical or electric? Uh, well, I'm, hmm. <laughs> that's a, that's a, that's a, I mean, it matters where, where I am. Like, that's the thing. It's like, you know, here now I am up in North, North Georgia. And I, I mountain bike ride and, 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 I, and I gravel ride all the time, right? Mm -hmm. But if I live any, anywhere I want, right? I'm obviously living near, near a velodrome and um, I still, uh, you know, I still might just go for a, a super sweet track bike. I love my, 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 my felt FRD, right? Yes. I love it. And yeah. um, maybe I get my left side drive um, bike and, and make it a mass start race. I mean, because I I mean I know that bike how fast that bike is. You know that bike is 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 pretty sweet. But um, but right now it's like you know I I do so much mountain biking, um, and again I don't I don't get people to only do one discipline. It'd be hard for me to do one bike, unlimited budget, what have you. I I'd probably buy one of the the felt super bikes. You know, okay, if, yeah, under, yeah. Under, under under the circumstances, but. I mean, I have so many bikes, it's ridiculous. Like people ask me, like, how many bikes do you have? I'm like, oh, I, it's more than 10, but it's less than 20. That I, they're mine, that, that I ride. Okay. So if I took you around the cycling center right now, it's like the school has, I think, 15 track bikes, Damn. but 11 of them, 11 belong to me. Like I've, I've, I've purchased and the kids use those bikes. So I don't count those as, as my, I'm talking about, I, I have, probably 14 personal bikes like eric was like oh how many road bikes do you have i'm like oh i think i have four road bikes and i have you know two track bikes that i like but now i have i have a a 170 170 um downhill bike i have a 130 130 i just bought it's awesome i love it Jesus. okay and then i have two single speed mountain bikes and I have two single speed cross bikes, which are also gravel bikes. I have one gravel bike. I, I do everything. Like that's the, my, my biggest problem every single day. Like kids are on, on break. So when it's not raining like it is today, I get to choose whatever bike I want to do. And that's hard. I look at my bikes and I go, okay, well, what am I doing today? And like, am I, am I riding my fully rigid 
um, mountain bike that I have set up for gravel racing that I love. It's fast. I mean, yeah. it's, it is, it is, and you know, uh, like E13, I mean, I don't get, I'm not sponsored by E13, but they make a cassette that has got a nine cog makes things awesome. You can ride, you know, when you have a nine and not a 10, wow. you know, your, your E range gear range really, you know, so there's, there's lots of cycling is so cool. I don't know how anybody just sticks to one discipline. Like I, um, I, I race um, as much as possible still. And um, sometimes I'm racing with the kids. Sometimes I race the master's category or whatever, but yeah, I know you do. Um, but w- the thing is, I just, I race all of the time. Right. And it doesn't matter. Like I get excited for a gravel race. I get excited for a mountain bike race. I'm getting excited for this dual slalom. I can't, w- can't believe again, I'm going to learn a new discipline. And my goal is going to be to be the fastest guy on, on my course. Right. Got to do yeah. it. Yeah, it's really you cool gonna- to it. It's good faster than it's the kids be, i'm i'm gonna i'm gonna try trust me they know <laughs> not we just, bad we just a, yeah we just had a gravel race this um two weeks ago and um and was it two weeks ago yeah two weeks ago and um i beat all of them i didn't think i was going to but i mean i wasn't trying to beat them one my best kid had had a mechanical okay one kid was one kid was sick the other kid my back hurts um and then um a couple of our kids were just, you know, it was a tough course. I created the course, so it was, it was going to be a tough, tough race. But, it, but yeah, I mean, it's, um, I, it's, it's hard to pick one bike because I'm still, I'm still doing, doing yeah. everything. Yeah. Not bad. Okay, I've got to, um, I got to ask you about one race, and we'll wrap this up. There's okay. one race that I've got to ask you about that you have won that I, is, is, is hollowed ground for me. That is the Tour of Somerville. Yeah. Talk to me about that race for you. Tour Somerville um, obviously is um, one of the races that's been going on for the longest in, in U.S. history. And um, when my father got transferred to uh, New Jersey from Detroit um, mm-hmm. back in 1978, you know, I had been in that race every single year. And I could not win that race as a junior. I couldn't win that race as a, as a senior until 1994. And so... Um, that race was was a was a monkey on my back that I couldn't get off at all. So I, usually when I win, when you see a picture of me winning, it's usually smiles, all happy and, and all good. Yeah, that was definitely a, a an angry post. Just finally to get that you know fist in the air, just like with with a big yell because it finally fell into my lap. But yeah, that that's a one point one mile course. They've changed the course a couple of little times, but usually it's one point one miles around four corners two long straightaways. Um, almost nobody could get away. It's almost always a field sprint because yeah. the field would go so, so fast. And then you come out of the last corner and it's like, you can't even see the finish line. I mean, it is a good, you know, 600 meters down there. Like no one's leading on a last corner and going, I'm lighting it up and let it go. It's like, no, it's like, you, you got to remember what, you know, what, um, uh, light signal you're going at because there's there's like four you go in the wrong one you're gonna have a problem but yeah i had um the interesting thing for me is i won that in 1994 and then my wife erica won it in 2014 and yeah. there's sort of two pictures of us that we um uh that she spliced together with us both posting almost at the same exact time period yes. so that was that was that was pretty cool but i, I was lucky i've been going oh yeah yeah you go yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it was, I've, I've been extremely lucky in my career to have won most things that I've wanted to win at least one time. There used to be a race before Somerville called Nutley. Yep. I won that in 1991, and that was an amazing. I loved that race. I'm so sad that that went away because yep. that race was. Um, I remember when I was a kid, like in 1984, I, I met Eric Hyden there, you know, because Eric Hyden's like you know, was racing for 7-Eleven mm-hmm, and was mm-hmm. like, oh my God, like that's the Olympic gold, five-time Olympic gold medalist from yeah. a couple of years ago. So yep. yeah, the, all the history of, I mean, but Somerville was, was big and, and huge. Uh, it was 15 miles away from my house and I was glad to, um, to win that. But I was, you know, Jonas will tell you of his maybe five wins. I think I let him out like three of them. So, and we weren't on the, and we weren't on the same team. I don't think any of them, to be honest with you. Um, I, I'm pretty sure that, um, he rode for Coors Light one year and then, uh, one year 
this is how racing used to be. Their race was closed, right? I mean, you, you entries would close. You, they'd let two, like 230 people, 210 people in the race. It was over 200. Yep. Jonas did, didn't get in. And so this kid that rode for Breakaway or something like that um, was like, hey, I'll give you my thing, but you got to ride our jersey. And I was like, he's like, sure, no problem. So there you go. Jonas ends up winning Somerville in someone different, you know, someone's different jersey. And again, I would um, I would lead I would lead him out when we had an opportunity to do that. So it's cool. Let's not get into your brother. Boy, that dude was a beast. Yeah, dog oh, man. I, okay, I gotta tell you this. My first experience with Jonas Carney, Stillwater Criterium, uh, 7-Eleven Junior Team shows up. I'm I'm a track guy. I, I just transferred from racing BMX. So I don't have any man, dude. I'm over my head. Okay, and your brother lapped me. <laughs> three times <laughs> okay it was the most humiliating demoralizing situation i tell that story all the time because it was my first time coming across jonas carney and he was and i'm i'm thinking i know that guy is a sprinter but damn yeah. how's he cl- how is he riding this hill a lot of i mean again it's 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 interesting my brother talks about how he hires people now that didn't even know he raced right and i understand me? that oh yeah because Think about the, think about um, how old kids are now, right? So if you're you're born in 2002, you're not going to realize, you know, because his career is ending in 2005, 2006. But yeah, people don't realize that aren't old and crusty. Like you know, I joke around. <laughs> and I, I I call um, when when Holloway and I have a, a little this uh, what you call it. I'll I'll, I'll throw the um, I'll, I'll say to him, okay, boomer. I'll call him a boomer. Yeah. right just to piss him off <laughs> and um so it's funny because he's always you know he's giving my giving me shit on my age and how i, I think about the things so I, go, I go okay boomer but anyways um yeah jonas was the absolutely i'll put this up against george and Campy, i'll put this up against lance i'll put it up against anybody he was the best junior ever yeah people don't realize that jonas and lance are the same age yep. and jonas won the junior road nationals in 1987 you know, 88 in Fort Collins at altitude. And the next year in 89, he won in, in Reading. I think it was in Reading or Lancaster, Pennsylvania and high humidity. So the one year, I mean, the one year he went to the line with Bobby Julek and smoked him, you know, Bobby couldn't get rid of him on the climbs because you know, again, back then Jonas wasn't a criterion rider. He was all around her. And a lot of people don't realize that he was, um, as a first year junior, he was fourth place in junior worlds in the points race. And the next year he was fifth. So he's doing the points race and doing the road race in Moscow. And, but yeah, if you looked at his batting average, it was ridiculous. I and mean, my dad like yeah. figured it out. He won like 95% of the races he did as a junior. Like, like that's juniors. Like, I mean, the only reason why people like, I love Corinne Rivera. I think she's awesome. And all these other kids that are, you guys had twice as many national championships to win than my brother mm-hmm. did. If you, we had all those events back then, he would have won even more of those, right? Yeah. That's what it comes down to. Yeah. Um, I think my brother was third in the match sprint um, as, at nationals as a last year junior. So you got the one guy that won that's in trouble with the law right now. Yeah. Know, he's got yes. A, he's, got a, he's, he's got a court date coming up. Yeah, he got a court date coming um, up. And the other guy, super guy, guy got second place, really great guy, um, didn't, uh, uh, left the sport pretty early. His name was J.D. Moffitt. J.D. Moffitt was, yeah, really good kid. Yep. And then Jones was third, right? So here you have the guy that wins the national road race is getting third in the sprints. Thing is that, you know, um, being a senior didn't, um, Jones had some health problems, he had um, Epstein-Barr pretty bad. Mm-hmm. And so his road career kind of, you know, didn't materialize to what it could be. I mean, he was the greatest criterium rider we've ever had. There's no, no, no doubt. He's won yeah. every criterium you can think of. But it's unfortunate that he never became that 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 road guy. And and we can. There's health stuff, but there's also the, the drug stuff too. Jonas yeah. and I have are, we're clean 100 all of the time, every single yeah. time. If yeah. I beat you, I beat you clean, and too bad. Sorry, that's the way yeah. it goes. Um, same thing with him and. So when I had a really bad crash in 1995, I, I, that's how I got this big scar on my face, all those teeth there are, um, so 95, here I am, 94, I, I, you know, I'm kicking ass on the road. I get a postal service contract. I turn it down for 95. A lot of people don't realize that postal service started in 1995 and 
and I was doing really, really well. So I was on the world's road team, won the national point series in 93, 94. I was third in the national point series, but I got injured halfway through the season. I was winning it by a lot. And then I got injured, but long story short, you know, I'm doing really well. I get a postal service contract crash on my face. I didn't take it crash on my face. I come back in 96. I'm like, all right, I'm looking at my power numbers, looking at everything. I'm going to come back. I'm going to retake all my shit. All of a sudden I'm not competitive anymore. I mean, not, not competitive. I, mean, I was still doing well, but I, I had the time trial record at the 89er stage race, uh, which was in Norman, Oklahoma yep. in 1994. In 1996, 20 people went faster than my record on that same course. And the conditions weren't like, ooh, fabulous. And so when you talk, talk to, you know, when you look at the transcripts of from George Hincapie and all these guys, you find out you know, when drugs really became a problem yeah. in the United States. So all of a sudden you have 95 and 96, the floodgates are open. If you're a clean bike rider, what do you need to do? You need to go to the track or you need to go to criteriums. And that's what me and my brother did, right? I was, mm -hmm. I, after 96, I was like, okay, I'm a track cyclist again. Mm -hmm. I was track, went to road, kicked ass on the road. Everything was looking wonderful. Oops, wow, this is really nasty. This is, I'm not, I'm not playing that game. So I just went to the track. Yeah. I'm fast. If you don't drop me, I'm gonna out sprint you. Yeah. And that was it. So people could be all doped up on goofballs. Doesn't matter, I motor pace really fast. <laughs> so, and that's, and that's, like that. that's how I adapted. And my brother has always cornered better than everybody. Like Robbie Ventura, great cyclist, awesome person. Love Robbie. Known him forever. Known him since uh, him and Jones were racing each other back in uh, like 1981, right? That's how long they go back. But Robbie Ventura, there's a, there's a picture of him crashing behind Jones in the last corner at Downers Grove, Criterium Nationals, because can't, no one can corner as fast as Jonas. Even Roberto Gage. Jolly would tell you, oh yeah, that's, it's like, he, um, he had that superpower. Everybody's got their superpower and his yeah. was, was cornering and yeah. that's, that's how he did it. Um, but yeah, no, it's, 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 um, the sport is, is in a good place right now with regard to the drug situations under control. It's just, you know, getting back to basics and I think we can get, make it uh, super again, but it's, um, it's going to take the right people doing the right things and it's getting the people out in certain places, I won't, I won't just pick on USA Cycling. Or, and we need to get the certain people out of power that caused the problems in the first place, right? Yeah, yeah. If, if, if you don't recognize that this was a bad idea and I need to fix this, it doesn't matter if you caused it or not, just fix it. Instead, it's trying to rebrand, recreate, and change it to, oh, it's the same thing but different, but it'll work this time. No, it, yeah. it do doesn't work anytime, right? Yeah. My message to everybody is lose money on juniors, lose it, invest in them. And hopefully that seed grows and that money comes back from them later on in life. You know, yeah. I know we're going in overtime. Last thing I'll tell you is like, come to college, um, be coached for free. Chris Carmichael damaged cycling. You know what happened? Everyone used to just coach kids. All the pros would just hand it down and, and, and it basically be a good person. He created coaching for money. Now everybody's got to get a coach and he's going to, you have to pay that coach. Cycling super expensive, super expensive. That's what people say, barrier to entry, right? So the bikes cost money, the entry fees, the travel, and now you got to pay a coach, right? Yeah. Come yeah. to Piedmont, you know, I'm coaching all these kids for free. Any kid that wants me to coach them, I'm coaching them. If you, ever, if you have your coach, I don't have a problem with that. You know, you, you have, but yeah. the free coaching from us is here. It's the same thing with all other varsity programs, right? That's what yeah. it comes down to is the, the pay your coach model hurt the sport. It didn't, you know, it, it didn't, didn't help. And I, and I know that's going to ruffle some feathers as well, but just think about how much it costs to race. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, I, I appreciate all the people, Daryl Benson and Lenny Preheim, all of these guys that coached me in the past, um, it was for free. They were never charged. My dad was never being charged to be coached by these people. Yeah. And they were just giving back because they were coached by somebody. In, in, so this business model, it's been damaging, you know? So, yeah. but there's ways, you know, if you talk to some elite riders and get some guidance, you know, fall in love with the sports, you know, you, you, you can, 
you can, you know, there, and there are probably people out there, you know, um, that give free tips. I mean, there, you, I just save that a couple hundred bucks a month for doing some events, you know, or, yeah. you know, fixing your bike. That's yeah. what I would say. Yeah. Okay. But this is what I'd like to do. Um, let people know how they can get in contact with you. If there's a kid that may listen to this, that is serious yeah. about cycling, that wants to go to Piedmont and to get a look, look by you, or even just get to talk to you about what direction to go. How can people get a hold of you? The best way to get a hold of me is by email. It's just my, my name, Jay Carney at piedmont.edu. So that's the easiest thing. And um, we're in North Georgia. We're a good school. I, I have to say that um, our, I wouldn't say our biggest problem at Piedmont is, but um, it's not everybody's accepted. There are a lot of other varsity programs out there that yeah. you apply you're in here yeah. um we've we've had to we've had to petition to get people in um that didn't hit all the markers right i think yeah. the average gpa for piedmont for the incoming freshman this last semester was 3.54 that's the average Ooh, okay yeah okay so here well, we we are a really good school it's got um um got programs with like Georgia Tech. You come to Piedmont for three years, you can go to Georgia Tech for two years, you get your engineering degree from there, get your physics degree from here. We have great relationships, we're a great school, but our varsity program rides and races more than anybody. I'll put that out there. And we're in Georgia, so we have really good weather and we're not in Atlanta, we're not in Savannah, we're not in a, in a metropolis, right? We are in the middle of nowhere. You better like riding your bike because that's what we got here. We got a a place called uh, Lake Russell. It's a wildlife refuge that's almost 20,000 acres. That's our park. So we've got all these, these dirt roads, all, these, all these, these cool trails, and that's usually where I go every, every day that it's, uh, it's, it's a good day. I'll go out there and beat myself up. But yeah, we got a great program. Um, come get your education. Do whatever you want to do. We do, um, we do everything but BMX. We don't have a BMX track, right? Yeah. So we have we race gravel, we race track, we go down to East Point every Wednesday during the summer and in the fall, uh, road, cyclocross, uh, mountain bike, we do it all. And we also have bikes too. So if you come here, you only have a road bike and you wanna try mountain biking or you wanna try track, we have a fleet of bicycles. That's the other thing our program has over to other things. I've purchased a bunch of bikes. Um, we have a bunch of equipment, tires and everything to keep your bikes running. We have a $10,000 park tool kit every tool you can think of everything wow. we have tools I've, I've been here this my starting my sixth year right we have tools i have no idea what they do they're still in the box because I, I have no idea we just bought the, the big super master set and i have no idea but <laughs> maybe some kid will come here and go oh yeah that's you know that's a frame straightening tool or whatever i don't know so oh my god okay well thank you jamie carney everybody to the todd cycling podcast we have uh, the man, the myth, Jamie Carney on. He is the uh, head cycling coach at Piedmont College in Georgia. Check him out. Cool. Thanks. You got it.